Hello, I want to welcome everyone to the power of our story. Uh, we are a place of safety and connection for those who protect us and um, active duty and retired. And we do this through sharing stories in a healing and judgment free zone. So if you're ever interested in coming and joining us on these virtual coffee and conversations, uh, just get on our website, thepowerofourstory.com, and then uh, that'll lead you to uh, getting our Zoom link and getting, getting you connected with us. So today, um, we are so thrilled to in, uh, welcome Jeremy Grono, and his talk is um the title is the long road home finding purpose in the wreckage and he says that after serving as an apache helicopter pilot for the army um he served for nine years in the army def defined much of who he was but returning home from afghanistan in 2017 he was greeted not by peace but by a storm of personal upheaval he was consumed by anger and depression, and that started his search for meaning and led him through various self-help resources and endless medical consultations, yet found little relief. So I'm going to leave you with that little cliffhanger and welcome Jeremy to share the rest of his story. So well, thank you. Welcome, thank you, Jeremy. Sarah. Thanks. Thanks again for having me. I'm really excited to be here and I'm glad that everybody's jumped on today. Um, I think in order to understand the magnitude of what happened after those events that, that you shared first, Sarah, I'm going to start from the beginning and share a little bit about my upbringing and my background. Um, as a kid, um, I grew up in, in Illinois and just outside the city of Chicago. My mom, the first real battle that I faced was that my mom had uh, breast cancer actually when she was pregnant with me. And um, she battled breast cancer for about two years, but she lost her life um, in December of 1991. And, um, you know, at, at nearly two years old is when I first had my traumatic experience where I lost my mother. And it was a challenging thing growing up in that scenario because, um, you know, I, well, I wasn't really raised in a Christian environment, wasn't really raised in an environment where I was asked about God or where my mother had gone. And so I wrestled with those questions because I think when you confront death at an early age, it really makes you think about where are you going on this planet? Why are we, why are we here? What's the purpose of all of this? And so I wrestled with that quite a bit growing up and um, knowing that from, from, the very few people that would talk about her, because I think a lot of people, um, you know, my grandmother and a lot of her family struggled with talking about her um, because of the pain that they dealt with in losing her at 32 years old. And so I didn't really know a lot about my mom growing up uh, outside of a few stories. But what I did hear was she was an amazing woman. She was a social worker working with young children and really wanted to make an impact on people's lives. Um, but I, it, it really, it really battled my view of God because the question that I had is why would God take somebody so good away from me at such a young age? And, uh, you know, I think that struggled my brother and I, I have an older brother. He, him and I battled that because we were raised by my father and, and a stepmother in an environment that um, was kind of a struggle to be honest with you. And, uh, we were exposed to a lot of things that I think a lot of kids should not be exposed to at, at young ages. Uh, there was a lot of drinking, a lot of arguing, a lot of fighting between my um, my father and my stepmother. And so it was kind of a tumultuous uh, environment to grow up in. And so, you know, the questions of well, why God and why did all this happen really stuck with me. Um, and so at a young age, I, I was taking on trauma quite a bit. And I didn't have good coping mechanisms. I didn't see people around me that were dealing with healthy cop coping mechanisms and, and dealing with their own suffering. And so I think honestly, growing up in that environment is part of the reason why I was attracted to the army, because I was used to the chaos, um, you know, uh, used to kind of fighting for my own and 
you know, trying to prove myself in an environment like that. And um, when I was in, um, when I was in college, my first year, I kind of followed the path of what I saw growing up and got into drinking, got into partying my freshman year of college. And I just felt empty in that. And after about a semester of doing that, I had played varsity sports in high school, played sports my whole life, but in college, I didn't play. And so I felt like, A, that that team aspect was missing in my life. I didn't have that anymore. And, and the satisfaction from drinking and partying wasn't doing it for me. And I actually, uh, a, mar a Marine recruiter was on base and walked by me and uh, my friend, and I actually went to a Marine recruiter first and was going to sign up for the Marines because I thought it would be a, a good thing to, to change my life and try to do something for our country because, you know, I think everybody who's, you know, in, in my generation and a little bit older saw what happened on September 11th and wanted to, to meet the call of doing something bigger than yourself. And so I went to the Marine recruiter. Um, they told me I would have to miss a semester of college in order to go to the, the basic training and come back and, and finish an ROTC program. And I was like, I, I knew deep down that if I skipped a, a semester of college, I probably wouldn't go back. And so I actually went to an, an army recruiter and they had a, what's called an SMP program that allowed me to go to basic training during my summer and then come back and be in the reserves until I graduated and then go active duty. So that's actually the reason I chose the army. Um, so I joined the army. I really had no idea what I was going to do in the army, but fortunately in the neighborhood that I um, lived in while I was in college, I had a, a friend who was a national guard, a black Hawk pilot. And he invited me up on a flight. Um, this is probably a year after I was in the military. He said, Hey, we're going up on a training flight over Lake Altoona in, in the North Georgia mountains, because by this time I was, I was in the South. I'd moved around growing up and, and landed in Georgia. And so um, I said, yes, I mean, who doesn't want to go on a helicopter ride for free and, and, and go fly around? So I, I got in and we flew around for about three hours. And by the time I landed, I had made up in my mind that this is what I was going to do. I was going to be a helicopter pilot. And so, I mean, I think it was the next week I signed up for ROTC at Kennesaw State University and had a specific mission of graduating and becoming a um, helicopter pilot. And fortunately I had success in that and, uh, ended up graduating in the top 10% in the nation. So I got to pick the job that I wanted, the branch that I wanted. So I picked uh, aviation and went to flight school, was very successful in that line of work. And it was a complete shift for me after having that break of, you know, being in sports and being successful in sports to kind of me meandering around trying to figure out what I wanted to do and then having a purpose in all of that. And so, um, you know, when I had that goal of becoming an Apache pilot, I was all in, was fixed on that. And I made that my goal and I uh, was happy to achieve that, went through flight school and ended up actually meeting my wife while I was in flight school. She was coincidentally uh, on a date with a Marine when I met her. Um, but that's a whole nother story. But um, so after flight school, we, um, I, I picked my duty station as Savannah, Georgia. So I got to pick Savannah, Georgia as my duty station because I wanted to stay here in the South, which is third infantry division. And so I, I went to the third ID and started training. We were uh, probably about a year in and we got noticed that they were going to be deploying one troop of our flight company um, every 10 months over about a two and a half, three year period. And so I actually volunteered for the third deployment and um, was selected as a platoon leader to get to go overseas with a company of Apache pilots to go to the eastern portion of Afghanistan. And by that time, it was about 2015. And um, again, I, I actually experienced some more traumatic events that I didn't really have the, the understanding in the worldview to kind of cope with it. I had a, a couple of uh, friends that 
committed suicide in the military. One was um, you know, somebody who I called a brother that I grew up with. And um, he was transitioning out of the military and, and took his life as he was transitioning out. And then I had another friend that uh, was kind of pushed too hard, I think, and um, took his own life as well. And so I was wrestling with that. We had a pretty heavy training program leading up to the deployment. We were gone probably, I don't know, four months out of the eight months leading up to the deployment. So it was a pretty high stress scenario leading, leading to that. My wife was also um, a couple months before I deployed. She fortunately got pregnant. And so we had a lot of things in the works and, but I was hard set on this. I want, I saw, I signed up for a reason. I wanted to deploy. I wanted to be able to serve my country. And, you know, there wasn't anything else that you could do to change my mind on that. And so deployed, went overseas, you know, we were um, in pretty heavy use at that time. Um, there was a restriction on the number of uh soldiers that were allowed overseas. I think it was Obama had it set at 10,000. So aviation assets were um, pretty heavily valued um, during that time period because there weren't a lot of people over there. And so all, everybody in special operations wanted Apaches overhead um, to obviously protect them and, and have another person to do reconnaissance while you're going in and getting targets. So we were we had a pretty fast operation tempo and uh, we were flying every, pretty much every night. Um, but again, there was, there was other things going around in the background. Um, while I was overseas, my wife was eight months pregnant. She ends up losing her mom and she, she suffered from alcoholism for a long time. And it finally took her life when she was, uh, when my wife was eight months pregnant. And so I'm in Afghanistan. I get a Red Cross message that my wife's in the hospital and my mother-in-law just died. And that was kind of, it was pretty eye-opening for me. I, I, I struggled with that. I didn't know what to do. Um, at that specific time, we had two other people in my company that didn't get sent home for the births of their their babies. And so I wasn't planning on getting to go home because aviation assets were in such high demand um but because her mom died and because she was hospitalized they let me go home for two weeks so they said hey you got two weeks we're gonna send you back home but we need you back on a flight because we you know we don't have enough assets over here to, to meet the mission demand and so i fortunately through that traumatic event was allowed to go home um before i get to that i, I missed one part of the story um, when I had first gotten over to Afghanistan, you know, I really, I was faced with death again in my life where, you know, within the first couple of missions, I'm seeing people die right in front of my life or right in front of my eyes. And it was, uh, it was hard to, when you're on mission, you're focused on getting the mission complete. But when you get back to base and you're thinking about everything that just happened, it's when you have those thoughts bubble up and you're thinking about you know, what just happened. And the thought that I could not get out of my head after that first time was, where are you going to go when you die? And that was something that repeated in the back of my mind over and over again, where are you going to go when you die? And it, it got me to the point at this point in my life, um, I was not a Christian. I would not, I would not be, I would not be one to say that I was a professing believer um, I was never exposed to Christianity growing up. I think I went to church maybe a handful of times by the time I was at this point in my life. Most of them were for weddings and funerals. Never really had a relationship with God and would at best call myself an agnostic. I think I had a view of things to where I thought there was a higher power, power but I didn't know who he was. And for some reason, it definitely wasn't Jesus. That was I made my mind up on that. It definitely wasn't Jesus. So but God had a different plan on that. Um, so one night after getting home um, from a flight and all of this other chaos was going on, I was in my, my room um, on base in Afghanistan. And I just, I had this urge coming from within me to pray. And I was thinking to myself, like, I don't even know how to pray. How do you pray? 
but I had this like feeling that I needed to pray. And it, it had been, I don't know, over a decade since I've gotten down on my knees, but I got down on my knees that night and um, I said, God, if, if you're real, I need to know that you're real. And uh, I need you to help me get home to see my daughter be born and be there for, for my wife. Cause at this time I hadn't, I hadn't gotten news that I was going to be able to get to go home. So I got up, went to bed and I was on night shift because all the missions that you do over there were at that time were, were done at night. So this was six in the morning. I go to bed, I wake up, you know, later that afternoon, come into the cruise shack. And um, as I walk in, some of the guys that were getting off shift were like, Hey, you know, we noticed um, some strange activity in the Chimkani Valley. We need you guys to go do a reconnaissance mission up to the North. This wasn't anything really out of ordinary. We were doing recon missions all the time. And so I didn't really think anything of it. Um, so we load up, get on, um, get on our way up to the north to the to Chimkani Valley where we were at on the eastern side of Afghanistan, um, right near Pakistan. We flew up into this valley. We, it's probably 14,000 feet peaks on both sides as you enter into this valley and we get in and we're looking around and at first we didn't see anything and then off in the distance we see this flashing light and at first first thing you think about is hey that's a muzzle flash we got some somebody shooting at us so we start doing orbits we start drawing closer um, towards that target area and the flashing lights continue to happen again and again and we're trying to figure out where this is coming from. You know, we're radioing that, hey, we're, we're in contact, we're receiving fire. And we keep going deeper and deeper into this valley. Um, well, it turns out that light was actually a strobe light at the end of the valley. And they were setting up a complex air ambush on me and my wingman. And so they drew us into the valley. And then as soon as we were halfway into the valley, we started receiving fire from probably about five different locations in this valley. And this was the first time that the contact was not directed from ground to ground, but from ground to air. And so they were planning to shoot one of us down. And we were flying around trying to figure out where all this enemy fire is coming from. In these high mountains, it's very difficult to find people, um, especially there's trees and dense veg vegetation all around us. And so I'm backseater so I'm the pilot of the second aircraft and my front seater cannot find any of these locations we're passing off targets from each other and trying to get him to look further but he can't see anything I finally break off to the north and try to come over a ridge line to get a better view from where we're taking fire at and I crest over the ridge line and we look down and there's an enemy fighting position and they just start uh, lobbing rounds at us and all you see is red tracer fire coming out of our aircraft. And um, that was uh, probably the closest moment, I would say, to um, at, at least in Afghanistan, to thinking I was about to get shot down. And we were in that valley probably another 10 minutes before we broke contact and flew back to base because we couldn't, we couldn't find any of these guys. And we were completely outmatched, outgunned, and not prepared for that. So we flew back to base. Me and my um co-pilot looked because we thought for sure we had gotten shot we looked at our aircraft search our aircraft for about 20 minutes there wasn't a single bullet hole in the aircraft and we were like what just happened and so i get back to my room and i'm thinking man i just prayed this prayer this morning and then this happens like what is going on and so that was really the first time where i was thinking well there might actually be somebody on the other side of these prayers there might actually be somebody that's listening. And um, it, I think it was a couple of weeks later that I got news that I was actually going to be sent back to go see my wife. She had been, she had gotten out of the hospital by then, um, but they were sending me back for two weeks to go see her. So I get back to Savannah, Georgia. I land. Um, we're, I'm home for about a week. And we go to the doctor, they say, hey, listen, um, your wife is, I think she was about 37 or 38 weeks pregnant at the, at the time. 
I was like, Hey, I'm leaving on Friday. Can we induce her? And can, can I be here for the birth of my daughter? And they said, well, legally we can't induce your wife until she is um, 39 weeks pregnant. So unfortunately you're going to, you're not going to be able to be here when your daughter's born. And so we were pretty upset about that, but we understood we wanted to put the health of my daughter ahead of me being there. And so we, we get back home and I'm packing up to get ready to fly back the next week. And a couple of days later, um, as I'm getting ready, I think it was a Monday, and my flight was supposed to fly out on that Thursday. Um, a hurricane actually picks up in um, the Atlantic and is start starting to move directly towards Savannah. Savannah hasn't had a hurricane come directly at Savannah in I think 100 years at this time. It was, and they just so happened to name the hurricane, Hurricane Matthew. So this hurricane came in and it actually um, nearly wrecked our house. Uh, we had to move inland and stay at a friend's house. There's trees thrown on our house and you know, everything was nearly flooded and Savannah was pretty wrecked, but it actually canceled my flight going back to Afghanistan. So that Saturday they induced my wife and I was able to be there for the, the birth of my daughter. And so, um, the, you know, a couple of days later after that, I'm on a flight going back to Afghanistan. And again, I'm thinking in the back of my head, what a strange coincidence it is that, um, I have prayed this prayer. I had this, you know, crazy ambush happened on my aircraft and I thought I was going to get shot down, but I was saved. And then a hurricane is sent, Hurricane Matthew is, is sent to cancel my flight. So I'm there for the birth of my child. Again, I, I like tried to write it off as in like coincidence, major coincidence. And um, I get back from Afghanistan at, at this time, you know, there's this, there's a sweet, this kind of honeymoon phase when you get back where it's, it's amazing. You're home. Everybody's happy. You're home. Um, but that slowly fades away and you have to deal with reality. For me, everything was different. Um, you know, I'm still kind of grieving the loss of a couple of friends committing suicide. My mother-in-law passed away. My wife was hospitalized. Um, you know, our home was wrecked from this hurricane and my parents at this time, my, my father and my stepmother were in the middle of this really heavy divorce. And it started while I was in Afghanistan and it, it got bad. It was terrible. And so everything that my life was before I left was completely different. And then you add on all the stress that you're dealing with from coming back home. And so I was pretty much at a breaking point. Um, I would say I, I had a ton of rage. I, I couldn't, I couldn't sleep. Kind of switching back sleep schedules um, so often. Physi physiology of, you know, trying to sleep was all messed up. But I would say on the psychology side, my mind, where my mind was at, was just in a bad place, and it continued to to get worse. I would say. Um, for the next six months. And I didn't want to go seek help because I was completely afraid. Um, you know, I've worked, you know, nearly 10 years at that point to become a pilot. And when you're in that position, you think, well, what is everybody going to think about me if I get labeled as somebody with PTSD? And so that's the last thing I wanted. Um, I ha unfortunately had some other health issues going on. My spinal cord was being pinched in my neck. Um, uh, because of de degenerative disc disease, I had it at three different levels. Uh, Army's not easy on your body, and neither is flying. So at that point, um, I was medically retired from the army, and then I got out the next year. And so, where I was before deployment to where I was, you know, two years later, I had lost my job, I had lost uh, my health, I had lost. Um, you know, my family, as far as my parents being divorced, um, lost my, my mother-in-law, everything I felt like was falling apart. And I, it just, it felt like everything was being taken away from me. And, you know, I would, I had this attitude of why me, why me, God, like, why are you, why are you doing this to me? If you are real, why is all of this happening? And um, my wife, fortunately, she is a godsend. Um, she had been a Christian her whole life, and she had been telling me for years, "Hey, you need to come with me to church. You need to, to you know, have a relationship with God." And 
she she probably dragged me kicking and screaming um, about a year after me getting out of the military to church and I fin- finally started going and we we joined a Bible study at, at our ch- at a local church in Georgia and coincidentally the leader of the Bible study was my guidance school counselor from high school and so um, again another crazy coincidence that was happening um, in my life right then and so. Um, what was interesting though, is up until that point, you know, I was kind of, in, I was definitely interested in trying to figure out, okay, is there a God and who is, who is God? Um, and I had tried to read the Bible probably two or three different times, but I always started from Genesis because I thought like any other book, you start from the beginning and you work through it. And man, I would get lost. Like, what is going on? This is like, these stories are crazy. There's all these genealogies and I just don't understand it. And it was funny because my guidance school counselor, the leader of the group, he was like, listen, man, you got to start with the good news. He said, read Matthew, you know, and I was, that was the first time it really hit me. And I was like, okay, well, I don't even know what that means, but I'll read Matthew. And um, I think it was a couple of weeks later, I was on a flight to Montreal for work and um, I started reading the book of Matthew and I could not put the book down. It, so from the, the start of the uh, from the start of the flight to when it finished, I had read the whole book. I couldn't put it down. I just was amazed because, in my view, uh, I had gathered this image of who Jesus was from culture, from the people that were around me, and from just I just thought he was a really nice guy. That, that was kind of my view of him. He was just a really good, really nice guy. But after reading Matthew, what I uh, I saw a warrior. I saw a completely different person. I saw the warrior king um, that was, excuse my language, that was a badass, you know, that that really um, was this this rebel and counterculture and didn't do anything the way people thought he should do it, but did it the right way. You can't look at his actions and say, wow, those are bad. Everyone knew he was good. When you read it, you realize like, man, I, I really wish I could be like this. And at that point, I was like, well, I don't know if he's God, but I know that if I could be like him, then I would be in a lot better place in my life. And so I was open to that and was really at that point, we were going to church regularly and was very open to it. But I think that the one nagging thing of why I didn't want to dive in so so far into Christianity was I was very concerned about what other people would think of me because I grew up in a family that was not Christian I grew up with friends that were not really professing Christians that were drinking, that were partying. And so I was more afraid of what everybody else was going to think than I was about concerned about my own life. And, uh, you know, I had even thought about getting baptized at that point, but I, I decided not to do that and wait a little bit. My wife and I, we planned a ski trip um, for that Christmas break. This was in 2019 at this point. And so I took my wife and my kids on a, on a ski trip to North Carolina, to Sugar Mountain. We had a great time. And as we packed up, we started heading home. Um, this is on the 23rd of December. So next week will be a four-year anniversary of this. Um, so just you know, two, two days before Christmas, we're coming home. And uh, we always, anytime we would go on a trip, my wife would always make us stop and get a Christmas ornament. She loves getting Christmas ornaments. And so we passed this place and um, this big Christmas ornament shop. I'm like, I turn around, go back. And so that way we can get a Christmas ornament. We get out of the car. There's thousands of Christmas ornaments. My wife's looking around and she decides to pick out an angel. So she buys this angel Christmas ornament. We're about to get back in the car. She looks at me. She says, hey, do you want me to drive? And I said, no, I got it. So I got back in the car. I refused. I said, no, I got this. Got back in the car, start heading down the highway. She knows that at this point, um, I would say because of untreated PTSD and anxiety, I'm one of those type of people that um, I would easily get stressed out. And I was always in a hurry. I was always in a rush. I just had to get home. I had to And so I think that was her nice way of saying, let me drive so you can relax in the car. 
and I was like, no, I want to get home. I want to get home as quick as we can and, and then just rest. Well, not even five minutes down the road, we're on the highway. I'm going probably 10, 15 miles an hour over the speed limit. It's drizzling rain. We come around a turn, we hydroplane, and we hydroplane at about 60 miles an hour right into a tree. The last last thing I remember was screaming out loud, uh, oh shit, Amanda, to my wife. That's my wife's name. And it was the most jarring impact explosion that I've ever experienced in my life. And we impacted the tree at 60 miles an hour. Um, I was knocked unconscious. Um, the parts that I'll tell you right now had to be told to me, but my wife, she actually put her hands up, broke both of her hands on the uh, dashboard. She saw me hunched over the vehicle. She thought I was dead because I was non-responsive and wasn't moving at all. Um, she had lacerations from the glass. My daughter, who's in the backseat, who's three years old, she had a brain injury. My son had broken a rib, rib in the car accident, and um, the car was smoking profusely. It was about to catch on fire. But fortunately, it was right across the street from um, this landscaping company, and they just so happened to have a couple employees that were getting ready to leave that were still there. And so they ran over. One of them had an ax broke out the back window of the call car, they called the police and they got my kids out of the car and the, the fire department had to come in order to get my wife out because she was stuck in the vehicle. And then it took them 30 minutes with the jaws of life to pry me out of the vehicle. Both of my legs were crushed. My right leg was fractured in about 30 places. My right foot was completely dislocated. I had um, shattered my um, left shoulder socket, collarbone, four broken ribs, I had a collapsed lung, severe brain injury. Um, and uh, I was in really rough shape, really rough shape. The first thing I remember after the car accident was just hearing grinding sounds from them trying to saw open the vehicle. And I remember looking out the window and seeing what I call the look of death. I looked at the paramedic and he looked at me like I was dying and what he was completely shocked that I was still alive. And so they finally get me out of the car. They rushed me to the hospital. Um, I remember looking down, my, my right leg was completely flipped over. My knee was over on the right hand side of my leg. So I knew I was in rough shape. We get to the hospital, the doctor comes up to me and he goes, hey, listen, there's, there's, not, a, there's not a doctor in this building that can put your leg back together. And he says, it's extremely fractured. Don't know what to tell you. And so um, at this point, I've got all my clothes cut off of me. I mean, I got like a blanket over me, but he, I have an army tattoo on my left shoulder. He looks at me and he goes, where did you, where did you serve? And, you know, I told him I was in 3rd Infantry Division. I deployed to Afghanistan. I was at Fob Shank. And I labeled a couple places that I was in Afghanistan. He goes, I was at Fob Shank. And he later told me that he was a Air Force surgeon and it just so happened that him and I served at the same place in Afghanistan, another coincidence. Um, but he says, listen, I did my residency with the director of orthopedic trauma at Grady. And he said, it's probably the best facility in the country that's going to be able to put your leg back together and, and, and put, you, put you back together, really. And, and he said, I don't know if I can get you in to see her because she's pretty busy, especially this time of year, but I'm going to give her a call. It just so happened she picked up the phone. She uh, made an appointment for me um, the next week, and they transported me in an ambulance to go to Grady to get my leg fixed. Um, so the next week, I'm in the hospital. It's early morning. I'm getting ready for my. Um, I'm getting ready for my operation. And I'm sitting there waiting to go in. And the, the doctor had already come out to me. She told me, she said, listen, man, this is bad as this is as bad as it gets. Your, your leg fracture is the top five worst tibial fractures I've ever seen. And she goes, I don't know if I'm going to be able to piece it together, but I'm going to do my best. And uh, she just, she's like, I'm just going to shoot it to you straight. It's like, this is as bad as it gets. I don't know that I'm going to be able to do what you want me to do, but I'm going to give it my best shot. And I was like, okay, well, I don't really have any other chances, so let's do it. So she goes back, back to the operating room. 
I'm waiting there and I'm just thinking like, man, this could be the last few moments of my life, you know? And so, uh, <laughs> Uh, like I had this thought, like, you should take a picture, you should take a selfie. And I don't know why, but I took this picture and I took a picture of me. I had a little smirk on my face. It's on the email that I think you sent out, Sarah, but I took the picture and put my phone down and they came right back to come get me, um, for the operation. They started wheeling me in and, um, as they wheeled me into the operating room, I apologize. It's phone um as they're wheeling me into the operating room um a familiar song comes on the radio and it's uh, a classic rock song that is very iconic to me and very familiar called spirit in the sky um and it's probably at this point in time i hadn't i didn't even realize that it was a gospel song because it's, it's such a great classic rock song and um but I started listening to the lyrics of the song for really the first time. And I, I thought to myself, it, the first words are when, when I die and they lay me to rest, going to go to the place that's the best when they lay me down to die, going up to the spirit in the sky. And I was just like, this is such a weird song for them to play in an operating room as I'm about to have the most severe surgery of my life. And right as I had that thought, the doctor looks at me and he goes, Hey, it's a perfect song for an Apache pilot. And I was like, what is going on? Is he, is he hearing my thoughts? Is um, Did they prepare this? And the song keeps going, going up to the spirit in the sky. That's where you're, where I'm going to go when I die, when I die and they let me to rest, going to go to the place that's the best. And at this point, I'm just thinking like, either this is God speaking directly to me, or this is the strangest coincidence of my entire life. And at that point, I just said, you know, I don't have what do I have? You know, I'm here. I am. I'm sitting in a hospital bed. I, you know, I'm no longer an Apache pilot. My, who knows if my wife is going to love me anymore after me nearly killing her and killing my kids. And I just felt so alone. I felt so scared. Um, and I didn't know what was about to happen. It was like, I'm here. I'm moving towards this event, the surgery that you don't know what the outcome's going to be. You don't know if you're ever going to wake up again and you got a few seconds left. And so I just started pouring my, I closed my eyes and started pouring my heart out to God. And I told him, I, I, you know, I, I really don't care if you save my leg. I don't care if, you know, I wake up at all. I just, if I do wake up, I want to wake up with Jesus in my heart. And I said, please forgive me. And I said, father into your hands, I commit my spirit. And at this point in my life, I had never even read those words by Jesus. That's actually in the gospel of Luke. That's not in the gospel of Matthew. And I would later read that months later on. And it, it wrecked me to think that I knew to say that in my worst moment when I thought I was about to die. And I had never even read those words before, but it just came out of me. And um, the song kept playing. And... Um, what's crazy is they put me on the operating room table. The song's still going. Um, never going to be a sinner. I've never sinned. I got a friend in Jesus. I just like keep hearing these lyrics. And right as they put the gas mask on me to put me out for the surgery, the, the she tells me to take, you know, a huge deep breath and you're going to be out. And so I put the mask on and I take a big deep breath. And that was the end of the song, right? As I was taking the breath. And then the last thought I had was, did they rehearse this? Like, was this rehearsed? It was so, it was so crazy. And so I'm out. Um, the surgery went on for um, over eight hours. It took um, a steel rod, four metal plates, and about 35 screws to put my tibia back together. But I woke up from the surgery. I was actually in the ICU when I woke up because I had lost so much blood and had nearly had to have multiple blood transfusions. Um, but I looked down at the end of my bed and I saw two feet. I saw toes on both sides of the bed. So I knew, I said, oh, I got, a, I got two feet, so I've got two legs. But it was the most intense pain that I've ever been in. It was like somebody took a, you know, a searing hot rod and jammed it through the middle of my leg but I was alive. I had both of my legs and it was, you know, as, as happy as you could be with the most of pain you've ever been in. I was, I was there. Um, they, a couple hours later when I finally, you know, kind of woke up and got off 
you know, the anesthesia, I had another thought come to my head and that it was go look at the picture. And I went and looked back at the picture. And if you've seen the picture, you can look at it. Um, but there's a clock in the background and I hadn't even known it when I took the picture that there was a clock behind me, but I looked at the picture and all I could see was the 707 in the background. And again, another thought came into my head, um, go to Matthew 7, 7. And I'd never like been one to look at verses in the Bible or have things like that happen, but I inherently knew waking up out of that, that I needed to go to chapter seven, verse seven in the book of Matthew. And I opened up the pages and it's actually from Jesus's sermon on the Mount. And I see the red letters. I'm looking on my phone and it's ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find knock and the door will be opened. For anyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be open. Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone, or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? And I just lost it just started weeping uncontrollably, broke down. I knew that that was God speaking directly to me and answered that prayer that I had prayed right there before the operation. I went in thinking that they were going to save my leg, but I came out with a brand new heart. I was completely changed. Um, it was the first time like the page, the letters on the page, like completely jumped out at me. And, um, it was amazing. So I had this amazing revelation right there in the hospital at Grady. So, you know, I get out of the hospital. It, I had to relearn how to walk. It was probably two, three years of rehab. Um, it was a heavy burden coming out of that car accident. But I had a completely different attitude. Now, I knew that God was real. I knew that he was with me. And I knew that he loved me because he revealed himself to me in my very worst moment when I was, wasn't doing anything good with my life and he revealed himself to me out of grace. And so I, I think he chose to reveal himself to me at that very moment because he needed me to realize that I couldn't, because I think before that moment, I thought I, I would often rationalize like, Hey, I was an Apache pilot. I served my country. I did so much good things for our country. If there is a heaven, God's going to let me in because I did all these great things. And that's how I would rationalize it in my head. But after all of this experience, I knew that there wasn't anything I could do to earn it. He's already earned it for me. And it's by his grace that he revealed himself to me right there in that moment in my worst moments of my life. And um, so the next couple of years were very challenging, very difficult, um, having to relearn to walk. You know, my wife, what's great is, you know, she had been praying for me for so long and she didn't think that I was going to have this radical transformation, but like afterwards I was completely changed. She was telling me, she's like, Jeremy, I need you to tone it down a little bit. She's like, you've gone like off the deep end with Jesus. I'm like, I just can't, I can't, I can't not be all in with anything. And so fortunately my, my zealous um, attitude about things has calmed down a little bit, but I was a hundred miles an hour trying to figure out, okay, now what, who, who am I supposed to be? What am I supposed to do now that I have a Lord and a savior and I have this warrior King Jesus who's leading from the front, taking me forward. And, you know, it's, I look back on it and it's amazing that he can take our very worst moments in life. And, you know, something that I looked back on in the short term when I was in the hospital at like, man, that was, that was the biggest mistake in my life was going too fast, nearly killing my wife and my kids. And now I meditate on that very moment as something that brings life to me because I see him in it. And so he's able to transform the worst moments into something that you can, that, that can bring life to you. And so it was, it was just an amazing experience. And that's really the purpose that I found in the wreckage of, of my life. And so um, it, we're now four, four years past that point. And, um, you know, last year it was heavy on my heart that I wanted to do something for the veteran community. And, you know, I was praying about it in my parking lot at work. 
um, I was I was working at a company that made software for so, presentation software for churches, um, and I went inside to work. I, I had just prayed like, "Hey God, you know, if there's something you want me to do, or if there's anything I can do to help veterans, please, you know, please show me." And so I go into work about an hour after I prayed that prayer. Um, I actually get a message from our COO and he goes and he sends me a message. He says, Hey, listen, these guys just bought a license of pro presenter. That's the software. And I think, I think it was really cool. The message that they sent and the guy who purchased the license said, Hey, we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing, um, for high risk veterans who are coming back from war. Um, our ministry is operation restored warriors. And, you know, thank you guys for making your software. And he's and my COO at that time had never sent me any sales information. Any info, I've been working there for three years. Never sent me anything about anybody who's purchased a license of our software. And he decides that day to send me um, an organization that is helping veterans. And so I reached out to them and went to one of their what they call drop zones. It's a healing, um, really a healing retreat, and um, experienced amazing healing through it through it at the beginning of this year and had really felt God leading me in a different direction. And so about halfway through this year, I, I ended up um, quitting my job. I started a graduate program at Liberty University in pastoral counseling and crisis intervention and trauma. And uh, my wife actually got pregnant with her third child. So had, had a lot going on within a short period of time, but um, really the highlights of my story are that if you're going through suffering, if you're going through bad things, I think the, the verse that I reflect on is Romans 8, 28, which is God brings all things together for good of those who love him and are, are called according to his purpose. And so if, if the suffering that you're dealing with is, I mean, it's, it's, there's no easy way to get through the suffering and tribulation that we go through, but I know that there are good things that God can bring from any circumstance if you allow him to do that. What an amazing story. I mean, talk about beauty coming from ashes and then, you know, um, just the way also that you were just built into a warrior before you even knew Christ. I mean, it's, it's amazing how he has equipped you in so many different ways. Thank you so much for sharing your story. That was really inspiring. Um, I do want to open it up to everybody. I, I just, I'm very curious. How is your, how are you and your family physically? So physically, um, I'm in the best shape that I've been in since the car accident. I still have some minor issues with my foot and my right knee. Still got a lot of hardware in my leg. But um, as far as where I'm at physically, I'm, I'm in great shape considering everything that I've been through. So, um, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Most people have no idea that I've been through such a traumatic experience and um, really bad leg injury. I walk pretty much normal now. I'm, I'm able to run. I work out five, six times a week, and I'm able to keep up with my kids as much as I can. So we're all doing good. We're all doing good. So thank you for asking. That's incredible. That is incredible. And when is your third due? So third is due a week before my birthday next year. So the first week of February. Oh, man, that's so beautiful. I'm so happy yeah. for you. Jeremy, what a thank great you, thank story. You. And I think so much there to inspire, I mean, anybody to be curious, you know, so thank you. What a story of hope. Um, I'd love to open it up to others to comment or question. If you have your little emoji and want to let me know that you want to say something. Oh, Barry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jeremy, thanks. You know, when, when I sit here and I think we're having these conversations, you know, my, my generation in my time, as I've said, from the Rhodesian Bush War in the 70s, you know, we're all in our 70s now, and and we had no clue about anything. We we would have never had a conversation like this. And it's only at this stage of our lives where even now I got a message, you know, half an hour ago from an ex-SAS Rhodesian boy, you know, in hospital with severe PTSD. We've suffered. 
And and when I listen to your story, I, I also reflect back on, I don't know if you've come across Dan Sheehan. He was an Apache. I have, yeah. And Dan and I were talking many years ago because we were both looking at what we can contribute to the veteran community. And I was looking at transitioning and what and a book to write on that. And Dan was writing his on journaling. And and I think what you really bring to me is that this there's three layers between operational experience and the present moment. There's the regathering of who you were. There's the the process of faith, whatever that may be. And 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 certainly in your case, um, it's a struggle. You know, we sometimes dragged screaming uh, and in pieces into faith. But faith can take a while to get to. And and the, so the next question is also, what do we do in the space between finding or not finding faith and learning how to reintegrate and work with what's happening in our bodies and our souls as we're in that process? And outside of your kind of almost that dragging into faith, what were the things that helped you um, in that process? Or was it just the experience of suffering and fire which is pretty much my generation, because we knew nothing about tools and we knew nothing about trauma. Um, what worked for you that others can share while they may or may not be finding their faith? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Great input, by the way. Thank you. Um, I think, you know, one, if I have one really strong attribute um, that God has blessed me with, it's the fact that I don't give up. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, throughout all the chaos, throughout all the pain, I've never, I've never given up. I've never thrown in the towel. Yes, you have moments. I think we all have moments where I like, I remember after the car accident, I, I would pray a couple, like very often to God, just take me home, just take me out of here because the pain was so intense. And, um, you know, fortunately he didn't answer those prayers. And, uh, I think two things that helped me through that that struggle the most is one, like I said, the ability to keep driving forward. I think you've, you know, I, I've heard it said by a, by a friend that you know, when you're walking, it's a, the Bible says to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It doesn't say to camp out there. We need to keep walking, you know. Um, and so I've always had the mentality of, you know, it, it, even though it looks like the house is burning down and everything is in pure chaos around you, you have to keep moving, keep making decisions, even if they end up being the wrong decisions, you got to keep going. And so fortunately I've had that attitude where I will keep moving no matter what is happening. And, um, I think the other thing that I would, I would, I wish I would have, I wish I could have had this before the car accident, but it took the car accident for this to happen was to be, to be honest with yourself and be honest with God. I think I was very afraid. I was more afraid about what everybody else was thinking of me than I was at really getting to know who I was as a person. And I let the influence of other people drive the decisions that I made in my life. From my family, I was like, I don't want to be the, the white sheep in the black sheep family or in front of friends. I don't want to be the, the crazy Jesus kid. Um, and I let that drive my pursuit of truth as opposed to opening, you know, app, you know, fast forward through the car accident. I didn't care what people thought of me. I mean, I like I had some terrible experiences in the hospital. And, you know, at that point. You, you just, when you're in that much pain, you just don't care what people think of you. And so I, I think it was a blessing in that I quit caring and just poured my heart out to God and just was completely honest with him and was brutally honest with myself. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jim. Thank you. <clears throat> that is very intense. I'm trying to imagine everything that you're sharing. Um, I think I want to use a, a minute just to say, with everything that Jeremy is sharing, he is actually going to start a book of Matthew Bible talk um, January 10th, Wednesday mornings at 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, which anybody is welcome to come on, you know, whether you feel like you have no idea about the Christian faith or those of you who do, you know, know the Bible, you are all welcome. 
And I also want to say that Barry Swarenstein also, um, we're talking details actually in a few a few few hours, but um, he is going to come. He's written a, an amazing book, um, Which Way Is Your Warrior Facing? Is that correct, Barry? Do I have the title right? Yeah, yeah, it is. It's, it's, I call it an operational manual for transitioning. So it just... Yes. I got tired of psychobabble. I'm, I'm a psychologist and I got tired of my kind laying their reps and their tools on veterans. And what I wanted to do was go back into my sitting with veterans over 22 years and my own experiences. And I realized that all the tools were already in their language and just that my kind were not bothering to figure that out and enter their territory rather than the other way around. So the book is is grounded in in the military. It is fantastic. The excerpts that I have read and everything that you're sharing, um, again, Barry Swarnstein for the transition process and Jeremy for building faith and hope. I, I am so thrilled to have you both um, added to our tribe in facilitating groups. Um, I, I'm excited to see all the support that our protectors can have in, in this um, arena. So thank you so much for your comment, Barry. And again, Jeremy, your story is just um, absolutely um, inspiring. Um, and, I, and I'd like to open it up for more comments, more questions. It's one of those deep stories that we have to process. Rick. Wow. Well, first, I just want to say thanks um, for having me here and and Jeremy for sharing your story. You know, it's one of those that gives you uh, goosebumps and and you saw some laughs and some chuckles because, you know, so, so I'm not chuckling at the situation so much as I'm chuckling about how God operates. Um, he meets us where we're at. Um, I can't, you know, as a military person, um, there's a lot of sarcasm that goes around and somehow, you know, uh, God knows how to communicate in our language. So he played, so the song, you know, Spirit in the Sky, you know, Sad to say I was hearing that like when it was out the first time, like, okay, so I'm <laughs> a little older. Um, but uh, but he communicates with us through his, you know, the way that we, that we need to communicate. There's an old hymn that says, you know, he walks with us and talks with us and calls us uh, his own. And um, and so that really strikes me. And then, um, you know, um, it's it's yeah. So it's just amazing how he how he talks to us and and hears us. And uh, prayer, you know, talking to him, it's it's gritty, right? You know, we have this idea that talking to God is, uh, oh, it's got to be this flowery language or something. And and if you read Psalms and how David talks to him, it's not like that. Um, you know, if you witnessed me out on a trail, you know, through some of my trials and tribulations, you know, my, my prayers kind of sound maybe close to R-rated, right? You know, just like, God, what the heck, you know? probably didn't use that word, you know, but just, and people, you can't talk to God like that. Like, look, you can, he, he's, he, he says, come to me, you know, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest for your souls. And you brought up Matthew. And so Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28. And, uh, and that's not, he's the God who cares. He's the God who heals. He's the one who doesn't leave us in our past failures. You know, it doesn't define us. And um, so, yeah, I saw, um, selfishly, you know, I, I scroll through so much stuff like you guys do. And I saw, uh, the talk, Sarah, and I was like, oh my gosh, I got to listen to this one. Um, a friend of mine is a SOAR 160 pilot, retired Black Hawk guy, Rick Cotto. Um, you know, you'd probably like him too. Great Jesus follower. And, um, so yeah, I'd love to continue having a conversation with you and really admire what you've been through and just how you shared you know, it's just real, you know, we make it way too complicated sometimes in terms of how we um, talk to God and, and, uh, you know, he does say, if we seek him diligently, we will find him. And I think that's where you were at. And there's that testimony. So anyway, thanks. Amen. Thank you. Excuse me, Rick, thank you so much for sharing. I'm really glad that you're here. Um, just to give a little plug to Soul Survivor Outdoor, it's amazing. It's like they, this organization gives our active duty um, a little time out and they do great activities and they um, just exciting, fun and being able to connect just to help people be refreshed again. Would you, you want to add anything, Rick? 
I, I just want to put a quick sure. nugget for you. <laughs> it's kind of, you know, it's, it's very, it's pretty unique and people say that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, so we started this, this, uh, outdoor adventure company ministry, uh, almost 10 years ago now. Um, you know, I was in charge of a bunch of wounded Marines near the end of my career. And it really, um, up to that point, if anybody said, you want to go into voc vocational ministry or be a pastor or counselor or something, I'd be, no, absolutely not. I don't want to do that. Um, but I was a Christian at the time, and then I saw that and I kind of got slapped upside the head. So fast forward, you know, 10 years later, here we are, we've hosted about 16,000 active duty military, uh, outdoor stuff. So it's just breaking down walls and building a conversation on rafting um skydiving we do a lot of skydiving rock climbing uh was just down at fort it's not called fort benning anymore uh but fort moore um skeet shooting in uh september i think it was and uh, just been all over the country and this year we hosted about 2500 and it's really basic i mean it's just like have an outdoor adventure activity have some food share testimony um I mean, if I'm going to be really selfish, that's what struck me. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I wonder if this guy's a Christian. And then you made it very clear, very quickly. And I'm like, Jeremy, you need to come and talk at one of our events. And we're going to be in Georgia in your neighborhood in the near future. Um, and these soldiers um, need to hear your story because it's like, can you be a warrior and a Christ follower? And people are like, no, you can be you can follow Thor, you know, Valhalla, <laughs> whatever. I'm like, no, Jesus is a warrior. God's a warrior um you know yes. zephaniah yeah. 317 says uh the great mighty warrior god dances and sings over us they can relate to the warrior part they don't they think what the heck is that dancing and singing part that's kind of weird um but god wants an intimate relationship with us he's been there from the beginning wanted to walk with us that's how it is and these war he's a warrior they're warriors and it's men and women coming out to this stuff so man um yeah, it's it's a fun time what we do. It's a lot of hard work, but we're all over the country and we've got a Green Beret leading our team in Tennessee. We've got a Marine Corps Master Sergeant leading in Texas. We've got a Marine Lieutenant Colonel in Colorado leading Colorado. Did you catch that? We that's three very harm uh very heavy army uh places. So um three three of the four of us are Marines, and yet we are serving more army uh, just by sheer numbers than uh than what we're doing um anywhere else and um it's 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 uh yeah so that's that's it we're having the you know and it's short it's and it's all active duty it had you know the veteran community um and all anybody served or not you can all come out and be part of our events it, we're not looking for military only but the ones who share um just to take certain things off the table you know if you're talking to an amputee, amputee, it's hard for somebody who's not one to say, well, what's your problem? I mean, suck it up. I mean, keep going. And it's like, well, you don't even know what you're talking about. So military kind of behaves the same way. It's, so if they can hear from a veteran or an active duty person, a faith perspective in an, in an engaging environment to just break that down. And um, yeah, it happens during the week. Military units are coming to us all the time. Can't even explain any of that. It's just a God thing because we're not that smart. You know, doesn't mean we don't work hard, but, you know, the investment return on investment far exceeds our inputs, no matter what they are. You know, where where sin abounds, grace abounds more. You can't ever outgive God. Um, and so anyway, I'm going to shut up now. That's Thank great. You. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Oh, go ahead. We, we definitely need to link up now that 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 sounds amazing. Thank you. When I saw you get a get on, Rick, I thought. Yep. Another good connection here. That's so, that's cool. Thank you. Right You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Um, Patrick. I just want to say thank you, Jeremy. I, um, my expectations were high and I knew, uh, that you were going to bring it, but you exceeded them. And, um, your, your story, we talked this morning about coincidences and um, yeah how amazing. I love how that came up and yeah I, I thought I would roll with it since we were talking about that earlier today yeah well and it's so um true I'm I'm so excited for this to be published so I can share it with some people who very much need to hear that and there are people we talked about earlier who are on this amazing journey where they're starting to realize that these aren't coincidences the amazing coincidence maker in the sky <laughs> yes. which is hard for a guy with a lisp to say <laughs> like me. Um, but thank you. I'm, I'm so honored. Uh, as you were talking, I had to, uh, 
I thought I was going to go mobile. So I went to my phone and your picture popped up with that huge clock in the background. And uh, I mean, there's no mistaking that it wasn't a uh, analog clock ticking away. It was a digital clock with very clear numbers and it led you right to your book that had your passage that you needed. So I, I'm yeah. in awe of you and your story. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Oof, great comment. Thanks, Patrick. Catherine. Hey, Jeremy. Thank you for sharing. Um, really incredible story. I um, So I was raised Catholic, went to Catholic school my whole life, even the first two years of college, Catholic college. Um, I've never been super religious, though. I've always believed in, in Jesus, and um, I've always found comfort in Jesus. But I'm curious because as of late, I have been finding myself wanting to kind of learn more, less from a, you have to read this because it's religion class perspective, um, more from a, I'm curious and I want to learn more about Jesus and the Bible and stuff. Um, if you had any recommendations for me wanting to sort of explore that, such as, I mean, I don't know, maybe it's reading Matthew or just any sort of resources that you might direct me to that could help me explore this. For sure. Yeah. I think for me, um, were my mistakes and before I was a Christian and becoming a Christian was diving into the books without any context and just trying to read start to back on whatever book it is. And so I would highly encourage getting a good study Bible. I use the ESV study Bible. I like that's one of my favorite, but I also have the Bible app on my phone and I have probably five or six different translations. And so when I get to a verse that I don't understand, I try to read as many translations of that verse as possible that are good translations to try and understand the context in that. Also, when you have a good study Bible, it will point to, well, what is this? The verse mean in this context and where does it apply? Um, because really the Bible is the first hyperlink text to ever exist in that there's references across the entire Bible. Um, when, you know, one verse is saying something, it's referencing something in the old Testament and you miss a lot of things. If you don't understand that one of my favorite teachers um, who actually passed away earlier this year, uh, Dr. Michael Heiser, he wrote a book called the unseen realm. Um, that really opened up my eyes to the Old Testament and really trying to understand um, what are these stories about? How do they apply today and how does it connect with the New Testament? So I would uh, it's it's a long read, but you, I don't think you'll ever read your Bible the same again after you read that book. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Great question, Catherine. Thank you for asking that. Um does anybody have any, Lisa, do you want to say something? I do. Um, Miss Catherine. So kind of like you, um, well, I accepted Jesus when I was 17, but I didn't really have, I didn't have the right support spiritually. Um, and, you know, and so I kind of kept on my way and living the party life and all that. Um, and I didn't realize, I always believed in God, but I didn't realize, you know, that, um, there's more to believing there's relationship. And anyway, on my journey, um, I came across one person I really like to listen to. It's kind of like either you like her or don't is Joyce Meyer. And she, she has this Bible out. Um, it's called the Everyday Life Bible. But what I love about it, Miss Catherine, is because like for my brain <laughs> um, and understanding, you know, kind of like what you said is, um, let's see, let me just give. A, uh, I just opened a page. <clears throat> it's in Matthew 7, 1 and, you know, talking about don't judge and criticize and condemn others. Well, Joyce, one thing I love about her, um, she's walked with God for like, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 years. And she'll put, can you see that kind of in the brown there? Um, she'll she'll put her little, I, this isn't what I want to say, but she'll put, uh, she just speaks what, how do I say it? I'm just going to read it real quick. Um, 
So she's talking about, well, this is Matthew 6, 33. I won't read the whole thing to you, but I'll just kind of give you insight to how she helped me understand some of the scriptures I didn't understand. Um, so she's saying like, simply put, I believe Matthew 6, 33 teaches that the main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing. We must know what the most important thing in our lives is and keep our priorities in line. In our society today, we see a huge emphasis on commerce and material things, but we must remember that things, we must remember that things are not most important to God. God wants us to have and enjoy nice things, but he demands first place in our lives. We are taught to seek the kingdom of God and his way of being and doing before we seek anything else. So she's just a good teacher um, that gives a little more insight into the verses that we read. Um, I'm sure you can find it on Amazon or whatever. I highly recommend it because um, I need all the help I can get. And it just gives me better understanding to some of the scriptures I may not understand. And I, I hope that's helpful. Yes, it is. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I think the, the one other thing, if I could add to that, Catherine, is uh, I think the success that I've had in developing a, a good relationship with God is that I put it on myself. I've taken ownership of it. I think it's very easy to put the ownership of your relationship with God on a pastor, on a priest, on your parents, on somebody else. And so taking ownership of that, just like your own marriage, I think you said on the last week that you are married, we have to take ownership in the relationships that we have and just saying like, God, I'm going to own this relationship with you and I want you to lead me to the truth and just speak honestly with them and, and own that. Thank you. Thank you. And I also, same as Jeremy, I, I love the Bible app. I love all the, you know, you can translate, you can do different translations and check different things out. They've got plans there too, but I love that, you know, really owning our journey with our relationship with God and others. Uh, thank you. And then I'm going to. You know, Jeremy, I think you gave, you gave a clue. I, I'm not a Christian, but I've had a faith for 47 years. And, you know, when you talked about when God talks, there's a whisper just on the edges and we don't want to hear it. But it's always there. And you can go to groups, as you said, Baya, and, and you can listen to people and you can read, which is good because it feeds our cognition. But I, I think the core thing is when you take time to listen and open your heart. And, you know, Jeremy, when you talked about that moment when you felt that voice enter you and you moved into tears, you know, when God really connects with us, we open our hearts to... It feels painful, but it's not. It's the stuff that's been sitting deep within us. And I always say it's right in the middle of our souls. And I think it's that making of time every day, the discipline. And, you know, when you talk about keep walking, I, I always say that, um, you, you know, I was a long distance runner, and but I was running away from a lot of stuff um, mm. till I injured myself. Um and, and I always used to say, if, if you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. If you can't crawl, sit down. But then get up, dust off, and move on. And, and that's the same with that voice, is continually the discipline every day of opening our hearts, creaking into whatever comes up. And, and just in that alone, our connection with God somehow becomes deeply and profound, deep and profound. So the only the only thing I've learned in my life is the making of that time. Yeah, the reading's wonderful. The gathering with people is wonderful. But just never getting caught up in the matrix of power and money and possession and greed. But every day to find that moment of silence to listen and open our hearts. Yes. I love that. Thanks, Barry. It's it's uh guys, this is just a wonderful um talk. I really appreciate you coming and sharing your story, Jeremy. Uh, what would you like us to walk away with? I think, like I said, towards the end, um, really what I have learned through throughout all the experience is there is purpose in the pain. There's purpose in the suffering. There's purpose in the tribulation. And if you don't see it yet, keep going, keep moving forward, 
and keep praying to God that he reveals himself and reveals what this is for. Uh, and keep praying that he gives you strength to continue through whatever it is that you're going through. Um, I, I, I wish I would have known that at an earlier age, but God has a perfect plan. And I'm just thankful to be uh, a vessel for him to use and to be able to speak through and to be able to share his amazing glory and um, his amazing, perfect design. And um, I'm, I feel very blessed now to be able to be on the backside of it, seeing everything that he's done. But I think everybody faces challenges. Everybody faces turmoil. And um, it's so challenging in that moment, you know, but if you, if you look at anything that's worth having, whether it's when you're working out, it's challenging, whether you're working hard at a degree or whether you're, you're starting a business, those challenging things uh, bring fulfillment and can bring purpose into your life. And so accept it, embrace it and keep moving forward. Excellent. So well said. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Uh, I, I really appreciate you being generous with your story. I appreciate everybody's comments. Thank you so much. And this is going to be, this is the last core group happening for 2023. And I think it could not end in a better way. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody.